the Financial Survival Network, helping you survive and thrive in the new economy. Go to carrylutz.com and sign up for 30 free micro trainings on financial survival. 1490 WGCH, this is Carrie Lutz, and you're listening to the Financial Survival Network which is brought to you by Miles Franklin. They've been in business selling gold and silver for over 20 years. And I'm a customer because when you buy, they ship. For more information, find them on the web at milesfranklin.com or give them a call at 800-822-8080 and get a free quote. Fourteen ninety WGCH. This is Carrie Lutz. You are listening and watching the Financial Survival Network. I've been following Greg Hunter's site USAWatchdog.com. God, for more than a year now, he's got original and insightful stories that you need to hear about because they affect your life, where your children go to college, if they go, whether you're ever going to be able to retire, which is becoming less and less likely by the day, and whether your country is going to become a third world banana republic, which it appears to be getting closer and closer to by the day. Hey, Greg, welcome to the Financial Survival Network. We're really happy to finally connect with you. Yeah, good to be here. Thanks for having me on your show, Gary. We really do appreciate you being here. You're a long-term media pro. You worked for CNN and the webs, as they used to call them, and now you're out on your own. What was that experience like working for these multinational conglomerates who who pretty much packaged news as a product like detergent or uh, mouthwash? Now you're on your own and you're trying to tell the truth. What's that transition like? Well, I was on Good Morning America, and uh, I, was, I was still at the networks at ABC before at CNN. Uh, when uh, they actually tried to do real news and actually went out and, uh, you know, uh, did real stories. And I did stuff about, you know, the degree fraud in the Pentagon where these guys were getting made, paid all this money. Uh, with CNN, I did depleted uranium munitions and how terrible it was, even though the Army says, oh, no, it's fine. It's not. It's, uh, you know, terrible, uh, uh, you know, half-life of 4.5 billion years. It contaminated uh, much of Iraq, according to my sources. Uh, and, you know, they love it because nothing can stop it. But anyway, I digress. Uh, and I was at, at there, you know, when they were still trying to do good work. I, but here's the thing. Nobody likes nobody likes when they have a investigative reporter like me. And uh, I remember them doing a promo, you know, three or four years after I got to uh, – Good Morning America. Good things were happening. And everybody was in there except for me. <laughs> so I wasn't one of the good things that was happening, even though I was, uh, you know, I followed the ratings and I knew the stuff I was doing was moving the needles. Anyway, the long and short of it is uh, it got so bad at CNN with the financial crisis is really was the tipping point for most of the media, I think. The financial crisis, because they tried to say it wasn't bad, that, that that subprime housing was contained. I mean, I was on the air saying that the president was basically full of hooey and that, uh, you know, all these guys say President Bush at the time. Right. Uh, all these guys say that, uh, uh, you know, that, oh, well, we're, you know, we're not really in recession and you can't knock out housing, uh, which got knocked out, as you know, autos got knocked out. It's back because of subprime. And the banks, and it's back because of TARP and endless amount of bailouts and, and deals cut so they wouldn't go to jail for perjury and forgery for the foreclosure fraud and, and security frauds. Nothing was uh, ever uh, prosecuted. And, you know, the banks got plus trillions of dollars in, in money. Sure. And, and so, uh, you know, I was saying, and uh, it's on my site, too, I've been saying many times because I said it's a reoccurring theme. In March of 2008, I was saying uh, all the banks are in trouble. And you would think that I was that you were looking at me and people were looking at me like I had two heads. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, about three weeks after uh, my final, you know, uh, foray into all the banks are in trouble. Uh, basically, they told me we didn't need you anymore. Your contacts, your contracts not being renewed. Now, you yeah, know, you play in New York City. That's an awful big, uh, you know, every everybody. There's a George Steinbrenner on every team. Right. And, uh, 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 you know, the CEO of uh, Time Warner was also on the board of City. And so, you know, uh, so that's that's what happened there. Did I get fired? No, I just didn't have my contract new. But, you know, everything I said happened. You can see it on my site. Uh, John Williams in 2008 
said that, uh, and I had, and I did an interview with him. I know I did lots of background checks to make sure these people weren't kooks. I mean, I did, I spent, you know, a few hours looking at all their credentials and stuff and saying, okay, I think I can put these guys on the air. They're real people. I've never seen them, but dang, they're real people. Williams is an Ivy League trained economist, shadowstats.com. And on my final story, which you can see on my site under the about section, is him saying uh, that his prediction was it's going to be very difficult for whoever's president in 2012. Pretty good prediction that we were going to have an increasing inflation. And he, he said he thought we'd have the beginnings of hyperinflation by 2014. He is now, I, I hear, moving that window up that that between now and uh, uh, this time next year, we should pretty much see the wheels coming off in terms of uh, heavy inflation. It's quite a story. So you tell the truth and there's no demand for the truth and they show you the door. Oh, now, there is demand for the truth. Well, but- oh, I was doing good on CNN. I was doing your money. And uh, the producer, the executive producer there, the senior producer there was saying, wow, you pe- spiked the show at the beginning. And at the, if I put you at the middle, it's there. You spike the show at the end, you know, especially at the end when we promote you the whole show. Oh, it was... People wanted to hear it. Well, I mean, people to hear the yeah, truth, pe- but the people want to hear the truth, but the companies, no, there's no demand for them to tell the truth. <laughs> and so now here you are, here you are, you're in North Carolina. I'm in Greenwich, Connecticut. We're talking about what's really happening. And the media is still off on that meme that prosperity is just around the corner. Happy times are here again. And you know, those those memes were back from the first Great Depression. We're in another Great Depression here. I don't think there's any question about oh, it. Oh, and this one's going to be ugly. You know, they had the John Edwards trial in Greensboro. And uh, I went downtown and was talking to, uh, you know, one of the big uh, ABC correspondents down there, Bob Woodward. And, uh, you know, I, I, he says, what are you doing here? Are you covering this? I said, no, I was in shorts. You know, I was getting ready to write an article or interview somebody or whatever. I just had to come down to the license offices across the street. And the amount of money they spent on John Edwards, uh, I, I told uh, Bob, who, who you know had one of the, the key points of, you know, the tawdry, you said you didn't have a love child. Yeah, who cares? Uh, you know, I mean, yes, listen, Edwards is a supreme weasel. Yeah, yeah. No, no question about it. Totally. However, that's none of my business. Uh, and, and, they find out, and they went after this guy for six weeks for, a, what, a million dollars or so, allegedly, of campaign. He was uh, acquitted on one charge and Hung, hung jury on the rest. So they went after him allegedly for a million or so dollars of campaign spending. I, tell, I was telling Bob, I said, Woodruff, I said, well, you know, Bob, you're going after this guy here, spending all this money, all the networks here, live trucks, satellite trucks, live shots. You know, there's millions of dollars of equipment, millions of dollars of airtime. And, you know, we had the biggest ripoff in history. You know, we had the foreclosure cry where they were, you know, forging documents and, uh, and basically committing perjury on the court. We had securities fraud. Uh, this stuff was rated triple A when indeed it wasn't. It was toxic. Uh, you know, we had uh, you know, a ratings fraud. This stuff wasn't triple A. It wasn't equal to a treasury. It was in the trillions of dollars. And they're going after him for about a million bucks. He just kind of looked at me like this. You know, I, again, the two head syndrome. And, you know, not a single Wall Street banker has gone to jail. And, you know, I've been railing about how none of these guys have gone to jail. We sent a thousand to jail successfully prosecuted in the wake of the savings and loan crisis, which is 70 times smaller, according to William Black, who's a professor of economics uh, and uh, uh, professor of law and a former banking regulator, top one of that era. And, uh, and I, you know, there's two reasons why they're corrupted this system. I mean, if you look at Jamie Dimon in front of Congress, I mean, I expected somebody to walk out, a Senate aide to walk out and hand him a scepter and a little crown. Oh, you're one of the best CEOs, and rightly so, you have the reputation, and rightly so, said one. Kay Hagan asked him, uh, how big was the trade, basically? And I can't tell you that. I, that's, that, that's confidential. If I protect my shareholders. No, when you take an oath in front of Congress, you, if you know the answer, you give it. And unless you're going to plead the fifth, are you pleading the fifth, Mr. Diamond? Of course, nobody wants to talk to him that way, and that's why I'd never get elected to the Senate. The other question, how, how big is the loss? Oh, I'm not going to tell you that either. either. Well, we found out nothing. He's telling the Congress, he's telling the Senate that they need to you know, do Simpson Bowles. And we were here to talk about Simpson Bowles. And here's what wasn't asked in the, in the Senate hearing. 
And I know why it wasn't asked. Uh, you know, Mr. Diamond, you said that, uh, you know, the system is safer. You have $70 trillion in derivatives, mostly interest rate swaps. Bank of America and Citigroup have more than 50. Goldman Sachs, $44 trillion in derivatives, mostly interest rate swaps. The leverage, according to Paul Craig Roberts, is astronomical compared to your risk capital. Goldman, more than 2,000 to, to one. And you say the system is better? And, oh, oh, and... Jamie Dimon, you know, he gets away with saying, well, you know, we did a bad thing, but that'll never happen again. We don't need any regulation. And they have FDIC backing. And I'll tell you why. The government is the facilitator. They know this because it's, as Jim Sinclair says, too stupid to be stupid. And what they're doing is they're playing the interest rate suppression game. And the banks know they're going to be backstopped by the government. And the, and the government knows we got to have these guys, you know, keep on suppressing interest rates. And boy, heaven forbid anybody go to jail because the banks are helping the government float the boat. This interest rate suppression game. Wow. 30 year mortgages, 3.6 percent, 15 year below 3 percent in the market still crashing. What would happen if interest rates just normalized at six or seven percent? And we got another Mexican cliff dive for housing. People are going to be so so disappointed when they bought that foreclosure and they got a good price. They really bought it at the new price. There is no way that housing uh, does well, uh, at least for a few more years. No way. And when rates go up, it'll really crash. Yeah, a lot of that's going to depend on what the dollar does, the future of the uh, global economic system, which is imploding in Europe now. So, so you went basically from an unknown voice on the web to somebody who got hundreds of thousands of visitors. And what do you attribute that to? You know, I, Carrie, I think, uh, I predict you will do well. Why? Because if you tell the truth, people want the truth. And anybody invest in money, large or small, they want the unvarnished truth. And what I do on my site is I try to um, back up everything I say. If I write something, if I have an opinion and I have a quote, boom, here's where I got that quote from. Link, link, I link to everybody. I, I tried to back up. I did make a mistake the other day, and 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 uh, I, I basically parroted something uh, Peter Schiff said without <laughs> without uh, giving him uh, attribution. But I didn't realize I was doing it. You know that we're better. We're better than we're worse. Uh, Spain is worse than us, uh, but we're better than Greece. Something like that. And I don't even know how we're even better than Greece, frankly. I mean, if you look at the uh, gap accounting that uh, you know uh, USA Today did recently, if you want to use a mainstream source, it's five trillion a year if you count everything, you know, Social Security, Medicaid, bank bailouts, everything, all expenditures, all, you know, it's a five trillion a year, not 1.3 trillion mm -hmm. and for the last few years. But we only have to cover the 1.3, 1.5, right? And uh, but for the last three, two years, 2010 and 11, we, we stacked up what, uh, you know, 10 trillion in real uh, uh, stuff that we have to pay for. And we're going to have another maybe close to 5 trillion this year, 15 trillion. And we're better than Greece. I don't think so. And yeah, and. Yeah. This is, I know you had Martin Armstrong on, and one of Martin Armstrong's, uh, and I, I don't want to uh, oversimplify his work because the man is brilliant, yeah. but one of his, uh, you know, uh, principles, one of his tenets of his work about his uh, economic uh, uh, theory cycles, or economic cycles, um, economic confidence model, that's what the proper name is, but it's, it's cycles of, of Economic and political cycles and economic cycles give way to political cycles like the 1920s and the 30s gave way to who? Adolf Hitler. Uh, in the uh, late 30s and uh, 40s, we had World War World War Two. Uh, so in the 20s gave way to Hitler in the 30s and World War Two in the 40s. And, you know, uh, I think we're headed for, uh, you know, some pretty disastrous cycles coming up. Uh, based on that kind of logic. And it's hard to argue that logic that uh, Martin Armstrong has, that these financial cycles give way to, uh, you know, political cycles. And the bad financial cycle is usually uh, a, a precursor to a bad political uh, happening. And look what's happening with the NDAA. You, know, you can put a bag over your head and drag them off, drag somebody off, you or me, without any charge indefinitely. They can just say, hey, we're helping the terrorists that when we are not. And I love this country. That just got invalidated but we'll see how it does on appeal uh it's all kind of frightening so the market is there for the truth people want to know and that's what i've been saying for a long time is if we had a true leader who got up there and said you know the system is broken beyond all repair there's nothing we can do to save it we're in a depression we are going to have to change our monetary system 
and we're going to experience a lower standard of living and all those entitlements and all that corporate welfare and all this regulatory morass that we've put ourselves through has to be done away with if we have any chance of ever coming out of it. I think people could accept that and I think they would accept it and they'd rally behind that. It reminds me of a movie, I can't remember the name of it, with Judge Reinhold and Eddie Albert where Eddie Albert's the head of this huge conglomerate and when he wants to make a major decision, he's they're like at a boardroom table and it's like a hundred feet long. And the way he makes a decision who to be the fall guy is he pulls two ball bearings out of his pocket and he rolls them down the table and whoever is lap, they wind up in and they're all like trying to get away from it. All these uh, mid-level executives trying to climb, you know, climb out the window, crawl under the table and judge Reinhold, the balls land in his lap and he has to go shut down a steel mill in Pennsylvania. And he goes there and he's immediately descended upon by the media and he's a little bit intoxicated on some controlled substances. And they said, why are you closing this steel plant? And he doesn't know what he's doing. He says, because we can't make any money at it. And all of a sudden the media, he becomes the darling because he told the truth. And, you know, that's what I feel like if somebody just got up there who was leading the country you know, not that the banks would ever allow it or the masters, the true masters of the system. But if somebody got up and told the people the truth, we're in a depression, the system's rotten to the core, we have to do away with it, we've got to go back to sound money, and we have to go back to creating wealth, not have a nation of consumers and a nation of benefit takers. I think that message would be overwhelming and the people would rally behind it and elect that person for as many terms as they could. Well, listen, the, the benefit takers, Social Security, people did pay into Social Security, okay? A portion. A portion, a portion. correct. But the first, I mean, you always hear, you know, Ryan, uh, you know, uh, Paul Ryan at, uh, you know, talking about we have to, you know, get control of this budget. Not a word about the bailouts of Fannie and Freddie. And likewise, same thing with the Democrats. This is why there are two heads in one monster. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, on one body. And that, uh, you know, I mean, you know, you want to, the, the liberals want to feed children. Uh, okay, let's cut off the banker bailouts. We gave in forgiveness and taking debt off the books of Bank of America, we gave that bank $200 billion in 2011. $127 billion, and eh, don't worry about the, you know, the, the buybacks of this toxic debt. And uh, $73 trillion at Fannie, uh, Freddie Mac uh, that they took off their, their books. Uh, $200 billion, one bank, one bank. And if you want to really uh, talk about entitlements, let's start with the banks. Listen, I am a capitalist. Uh, you know, Larry Kudlow, I'm a true market capitalist. Really? So am I. No dollar swaps to Europe. Uh, you, if you can make all the money you want, that's great. We'll have a 15% tax rate. No problem with that. But if you go out of business, if you have your risk model wrong, hey, you're done. Bye-bye, shareholders, bondholders, peace, love, no golden parachute, bam, you're out. Hey, guess what would happen to that risk model? They'd be at about six times uh, the leverage. Hey, Greg, That's what would happen to the risk model. Greg, remember when you were a kid and your mother brought you to the local bank and you opened a savings account? Yeah. And, and you might have 5%. even right, and you might have even 5%. met the president of the bank. And this is a very conservative institution. You know, generally there was one branch. They knew all the business people in town. When you went for a loan. They knew who you were. They knew whether you were responsible or not. And they knew your collateral, the value of it. And there was integrity built into the system. Nowadays, there is zero integrity. There's no checks and balances. And it's some NBA. And I know these people. I'm friends with a lot of them. But he's got a spreadsheet. And he puts your numbers in that spreadsheet. And based on what they come out to on the bottom of the spreadsheet, that determines whether you get the loan or not. And if you don't pay it back, probably be somebody else's problem anyway. That's the that's really the problem with the system and the country. No, no striving for integrity, no benefit that people perceive doing the right thing. Anyway, Greg, we got to get going, but uh, usawatchdog.com, on the financialsurvivalnetwork.com, we link to your stuff constantly. 
I highly recommend Thanks. the interview with Paul Craig Roberts because that man really knows. He's an insider. He knows the deal. So on that note, Greg, we will talk with you again soon. Thanks for being on. Keep up the great work. Thanks for having me on, Kerry.